Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the world's first and only live jiu-jitsu show. Brought to you by Zebra Mats, Simply Z Best, and Q5 Labs, Stay Alpha. Hey guys, I'm Budo Jake. This is a new episode of This Week in BJJ. Today is October 4th, 2013, and today we're going to talk about the Abu Dhabi Pro West Coast Trials, the Masters and Seniors Worlds, the BJJ Expo, some uh, a new Shoyu and we're going to have a couple special guests, Keenan Cornelius and Michael Liar Jr. So don't go anywhere, and let's talk about the news. <laughs> One of the biggest jiu-jitsu techniques now is the barambolo. People are always trying to figure out how to defeat it. Well, one guy has a unique idea. Let's take a look at the clip. So any of you guys out there, feel free to try that technique in your academies and let me know how it works out for you. I most likely will not be trying it out. So uh, last weekend was the Abu Dhabi Pro West Coast Trials. Last year there was uh, a number of trials. This year there's only two, one on the uh, uh, West Coast, which was at the Pyramid in Long Beach, and another one coming up in New York City. So I'm going to run through a list, and we're actually going to see some videos of some of the winners of each division. First, in the under 141 pounds, we had Samir Shantri. Everybody knows Samir one of Kyle Terra's training partners. And his opponent is uh, Brent. Just forgot his name. But uh, he just uh, he just joined up with Kyle's team. He used to be with Paragon. So this match was uh, between teammates, a very technical match but maybe not a 100% real match. Yeah, Milton is the guy's name on top. And competing a lot at the rooster weight level. Both of these guys are active IBJJF referees as well. So it's nice to see a little demonstration of technique as opposed to just a hand raise. So Samir Shantri took that division. And then next up in the under 167 pound division, we had Osvaldo Cachino Moizinho, another training partner of Cayotera. This is Cachino on top. He's also a referee. He's, force, he's uh, facing Choi Wan Choi, fighting for, for Team Atos. The winners of each of these divisions that we're watching gets a ticket to fight at the Abu Dhabi Pro World Championships in Abu Dhabi. Next up, in the under 180 pounds, we have Carlos Diego Ferreira. This is Carlos on the right in the blue gi, facing Majid Hage in the black gi. Majid, as many of you know, is known for the baseball choke. He choked uh, two guys with that choke this weekend, and he tries it on Carlos, but Carlos uh, defends well. Here he goes, rolling for the baseball choke. And Carlos slipped his head out. And then in the, heavy, the uh, under 207 pound weight division, we have Keenan Cornelius. This was Keenan's first tournament at Black Belt. He had two submissions in his division and two submissions in the absolute, submitting all four of his opponents. Yes, yes, 
Here is the last match uh, facing Gustavo Pires. And here he is facing Elliot Kelly. In the over 220 pounds, Carlos Farias was the champion. You might remember Carlos if you're a regular viewer of the show. He faced AJ Agassiz arm in Las Vegas and is an absolute beast. Here he is smashing Joao Assis. Joao had a super fast submission in his first match. Uh, with an ankle lock, and this one it just looks like uh, Carlos was a little too much to deal with. In the absolute division, uh, Keenan Cornelius also won that one. Did we already show those matches? Okay, let's take a look at the absolute matches with Keenan Cornelius. Here he is facing Majid Hage. He can sweep straight to an arm lock. And that was it. Congratulations, all you guys, and good luck in the Abu Dhabi Pro World Championship. So another amazing event coming up is the BGJ Expo. This is going to be on November 9th and 10th, and we're going to be doing the live broadcast on both days. And, uh, man, what an event this is going to be. There's going to be a tournament for a number of belts, black belts, brown belts, and I'm not sure about the lower ones. And there's also going to be some amazing super fights. The first uh, matches, a few, some of them have been announced, some of them have not. But the biggest one for sure right now, Crone Gracie versus Rodolfo Vieira. It's going to take place there. This is going to be a no-gi match. Then we're going to see Leandro Lowe versus Homolo Hall. One of the best guard passers versus one of the best guards. So that'll be very interesting. Then we have Cyborg versus Dean Lister. And Jeff Glover versus Bruno Malfasini. Samuel Braga is going to take on Joao Miao. This is going to be the Battle of the Barambolo. And that is so far, this is the only match that's going to be a gi match. And then we also have Keenan Cornelius versus Lucas Leitch. There's going to be more matches uh, announced in the future, but this is going to be an incredible event. And some of the matches are going to take, some of the super fights are going to take place on Saturday and some on Sunday. So mark your calendars now, November 9th and 10th. Uh, anywhere in the world you're watching, you can watch it live uh, on Budo Videos. And if you're going to attend live, it's going to be held in Long Beach. And there's going to be uh, seminars, autograph signings, and tons more things to do there at that expo. We'll keep you guys informed. Uh, one more thing to talk about today, and that is the Masters and Seniors Worlds. This is an annual event held at the Cal State Long Beach Pyramid. We're going to be doing a live broadcast on Saturday and Sunday. As usual, we're using the Multimat technology. So if you have any friends or family members that are, that are competing, you'll be guaranteed to watch every single match, every mat, either day. Some of the guys that are going to be competing include Fabio Passos, Brandon Mullins, Daniel Beleza, Flavio Almeida, Roberto Tusa Alencar, Ricardo Bastos, Bruno Bastos, Joao Assis, Gabriel Vela, and yours truly. So it's going to be a great event. Uh, head on over to ibjjftv.com, get your pay-per-view pass, and hope to see you there. It's going to be the normal commentary crew of Sean Williams, Caleb, and I on Sunday with you. Okay, guys, let's talk about some new products.
First up, everybody's always asking me when they can get another show your roll gi, because the gis usually come in and they go in about the same day or two. The next one is going to be released on Wednesday, October 9th at 10 a.m. It's called the Oryx. Let's take a look at a short video clip here. This was inspired by a famous Japanese baseball player named Ichiro. It's a navy, navy blue gi with some yellow highlights. Very nice color combination, in my opinion. Shoyro gis come in a number of different sizes and some sizes that are specifically cut for females. So if you're looking for a tailor fit gi, this might be the one for you. Again, going on sale on Wednesday, October 9th at 10 a.m. on budovideos.com. The Shoyro Oryx. Next up is the Scramble hoodie. Scramble's a unique company out of England. Uh, interesting note, the uh, founder of that company and I both lived in the same place in Japan. So lots of uh, Japanese influences in their designs. This one actually has English, Portuguese, and Japanese words on it. Uh, very unique, and I can also say very comfortable hoodie. It's lightweight and super soft. Last thing up for today, and that is the Desert Sun Kimono by Control Industries. These should be shipping uh, sometime this week. And even though there's a beautiful female in the picture, it's not a female gi. Of course, it can be worn by women, but it's uh, just their standard cut that's designed for men or women. Very nice looking gi and shipping very soon. Okay, guys, in a moment, we're going to have Keenan Cornelius and Michael Liero Jr. But first, let's talk about the latest Black Belt promotions. First up is Champ Tremaine. He was promoted to black belt by Hinato Verissimo. Next up, Cesar D'Souza was promoted by Joseph Maual, as well as Isaac Chavez. John Salter was promoted by Shan Hammonds. Michael Stump Brown was promoted by Flavio Baring. Dave Weston and Matt Tonkin were, were uh, promoted by Ninos Damo. Denise Griffin got her black belt by Eduardo de Lima. John Machado promoted Tim Lopez. And finally, MMA fighters Kane Velasquez and Diego Sanchez received their black belts from Leandro Vieira and Tusa. Congratulations, guys. Of course, one of the biggest promotions to talk about this week is Keenan Cornelius. He received his black belt, and he'll be on in just a moment, so don't go anywhere. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey guys, welcome back. We're here with two special guests. We got Keenan Cornelius and Michael Yarrow Jr. Thanks for coming in today, guys. Thanks for having us. Of course. So first of all, Keenan, congratulations on your black belt. As a recent black belt myself, I know it's a pretty amazing experience. How did it hit you? I really didn't think it was going to be a big deal because um, I was like expecting it for a long time. I was like ready for. It. I wanted to compete at black belt, and I was re like I was starting to feel like I didn't want to compete at brown belt anymore. Um, and I was just like, okay, I just want this. I just want my ticket to go compete against the better guys, you know. But when I actually got it, it was actually very emotional for me, especially because um, Andre Galvaus called my family and told them about it, and they all came and surprised me. And so when I, I he called me up to give me my belt, and I looked up, and my dad was there, and it was just it was a really cool feeling. And when he tied it around me, like maybe it was of course it was in my own head, but I kind of felt like a sense of like power like washed through me. It was just a cool feeling. So it's been a few weeks now. Do you feel any difference between the Keenan Brown Belt and the Keenan now? Um, I mean, I hope I'm always getting better, but I've always said that when you go up in belt, like you do go up in skill too. Just because it, something psychological happens when you get that next belt and you, I don't know what it is, maybe you just try harder in the gym or whatever it is, but uh, there's definitely a difference, I think. Um, just in motivation too. Like it right. just helps to be, just it's a fresh start. You get to start over, do everything new. I just like it a lot. There's no new techniques at black belt, but there are at brown belt. I'm talking about IBJF legal techniques. Mm -hmm. How has that affected your game? Because you're a guy that's inverting and doing a lot of stuff that might be exposing the feet. Now at brown belt, you have to worry about that. So Michael Lira, uh, relatively new brown belt, how are you dealing with that? Uh, I thought it was going to be a bigger problem than it than it has been. Uh, you know, I never really trained too many knee bars and toe holds before, but then the first few tournaments I competed, I I got a knee bar and I started going for toe holds. And uh, before I'd tap really fast to them in the gym, and when we went to the tournaments and they started attacking my feet, it didn't seem like too big of a problem. So it was nice, you know, I, I thought it was gonna be a lot harder than it has been. But uh, it's definitely a completely different game. There's a lot of different attacks that, and defenses that come with toe holds and knee bars. So uh, I'm just trying to work to get better at them. And, it's it's been good. It's a pretty quick learning curve, though. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah. Like, if uh, we were actually just talking about it today, how Lear should do ADCC, and uh, Professor Andre is saying like how he used to be afraid of footlocks, but like I don't, I've never noticed that. And I've only been there for a couple months, and since I was there, he already knew how to defend them pretty much. I think after you go against Polaris and you do okay, that uh, the yeah, fear yeah. of footlocks disappears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got a lot of stuff to talk about, but since we're on this topic of a new black belt, somebody uh, sent in a question. And he, he addressed this to, to you and, and me, Keenan. He said, there's a, a new black belt at the academy I go to. And when he was a brown belt, everything was cool. But now, and he was always helping people. But now, since he's a black belt, this guy has become very intense. Uh, he's being cocky. He tries to kill the lower belts. Yells at the people when they make mistakes. Gets angry. Asks, <laughs> and, yeah, gets angry when people ask too many questions. Is this a normal thing for a new black belt or, or not? Uh Lyra, have I been doing that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Maybe a little. <laughs> no, I don't know. That guy just sounds like a jerk. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think it depends. You know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, and you know, you might think you're the man. Yeah. You know, but when you're no, like, you definitely have those Matt heroes. You know, that they once they they're like, yeah, I'm I'm the top dog around here, and they'll try and kill everyone. But chances are, he's probably not that good if he's right. acting like that. You know, usually when you're good, you kind of know you're good, and you just you don't really need to go and prove it to everyone. You know, that's just bully mentality. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think that's a normal thing at all. Just play lapel guard against him, he won't pass. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, you've been using the lapels a lot lately. Uh, yeah, I saw some yeah. lapel, lapel plata action going on in your matches last yeah. week. And is that something new for you? Um, I actually started doing it um, like 2011 when I first went to Maryland, and JT was just passing my guard at will and tapping me at will. And I start like I saw uh, Cobrina use it a long time ago, and I kind of started playing with it. I didn't really know the techniques, and I just used that just to stall for a long time. For like a good six months, JT wouldn't want to roll with me because I just like wrap my foot in around his lapel three times and just hang on as hard as I could. Um, and so after a while, I stopped using that because I started getting better at like more traditional guards. And uh, but I always busted out like in 
high level matches like people have really good guard passing like i tried to use it against uh rodolfo um but it is kind of a new thing i, I play it a little differently than some of the other people i've seen playing it seems like there's a lot of variations to it like braulio plays it almost like a leg lasso with his foot like in a stirrup and like i play it different i play with like a cross grip no no same side grip and i put my heel like in their gi on the outside and then uh cobrina was playing it with both feet in the lapel like a spider guard almost so there's a lot of variation to it um i mean pretty much you could play all guards on the lapel like their arms you know so it's like lapel guard also is lapel lasso guard lapel spider guard lapel delahiva guard like all that stuff but uh like the the lapel plata stuff that i i, I saw that from like cobrina dvds like the spin on uh, spinning under one but i have a, i have a few good tricks from there i've always told myself i was going to save it for black belt i didn't want to show like but i used it against jackson souza too because I was like kind of like freaked out about Jackson Souza, so I used that. <laughs> it was like my fallback technique. So you you competed against black belts before. You went to Copa Podio, and uh, but last a uh, couple weeks ago was your first time at the Abu Dhabi Pro Trials competing in the black belt division. How did that feel? It was a good experience. I tried not to like. It was a good starting out tournament because half the people there were brown belts last year too. So it wasn't really a huge jump up in skill. Like I'm not competing against the world champions or anything at that tournament. Uh, I mean, I had already competed against Rodolfo and like Alex Sassoni and Sanji as a brown belt, you know, so this was kind of a step down from that. But it was good just to get the competition jitters out of the way. I hadn't competed in a while because I, I didn't do nationals because I had an injury and um, I didn't do Copa Podio because I was trying to focus on my Nogi stuff. And uh, so it was just a fun tournament. It was good to fight those guys. Is there anybody in particular you'd like to face? At black belt? I just want to fight everyone. I just want to try and beat everyone. That's all. No one in particular. And you, could, you can't really decide anyways. You know, it's all just how the brackets are lined up. Well, you never know. We might be able to set up a super fight oh, yeah, for you. Super it. fights, for sure. And, uh, Michael, what's your next tournament coming up? Uh, I'm going to be competing at the Nogi Worlds right now. I'm just helping uh, Keenan and Professor and JT train for ADCC. And then I'm using that camp as well to help me prepare for Nogi Worlds. And then uh, one week after... I'm going to compete at the Long Beach Jiu-Jitsu Expo, Expo mm -hmm. in the Brown Belt Grand Prix. I just got invited last night, so I'm really excited about that. Nice. As few people that might not know, Michael Liera has competed and won almost everything. The, the Pan Championships he won in 2013 at Purple Belt 2011 at Blue Belt, and the same thing with Worlds 2013 and 2011 champion, and you also won the Jiu-Jitsu Battle. Do you prefer Jiu-Jitsu Battle type of events or the big IBJJF tournaments? Uh, there's, you know, they're two completely different experiences. I really enjoyed the jujitsu battle and, uh, you know, it was cool because it was just eight people and, you know, it was pretty much the best eight at that time in the area that they could grab. And it was kind of cool because there's so many competitors at the, the IBJJF tournaments that, you know, you're just one out of hundreds that get gold. And at the jujitsu battle, it was just all focus on one bracket, you know? So I probably prefer the the jujitsu battle type events and and super fights and stuff like that, but uh, I I enjoy competing IBJJF too. I love IBJJF. <laughs> Why is that? I hate all like no time limit submissions, any submission only, because they're so like remember how we were talking about earlier like people in the gym they are like don't care about points as much and so they'll like mm -hmm. defend differently. In IBJJF, if you go to take someone's back and you don't have a hook. They're worrying about that hook because they don't want the points scored against you. And if there's only one hand defending the neck, you're going to choke them so much easier. Whereas in, like, when I competed in the Kumite, a lot of times you go to take someone's back, they don't care about the hooks. They just come immediately here and they're covering yeah, up. Funny. And it's like, it can be frustrating. And it's not as dynamic, I feel. Like, when there's points involved, it creates much more of an urgency. And in that urgency is, like, when you see a lot more techniques. And, like, if in, like, a submission-only match, if you're going against someone and you can feel that they're better than you, already like because you can feel when you roll with someone if they're gonna you know put pressure on you yeah. you feel kind of like whoa this guy's really like wrecking my guard right now you can like turtle up kind of and just be like okay i'm just not going to get submitted i need to just wait for something that can create really boring matches if there's like a skill deficit like that so i like the points i think that i think it's a large uh, uh, largely misinterpreted by like the online community who watches submission only versus uh, points like they think submission only is more exciting but really the, like the 40 minute submission only matches that can go on that's not exciting right? yeah. you know like maybe the highlights are but the actual thing I'd much rather watch an IBJJF match I prefer the IBJJF rules but with like the attention of like a super fight or, or jujitsu battle type event you sure because I really like the IBJJF rules 
um, like Keenan was saying, it forces you to, to give up your back or give up, you know, your arms from the side control. Because the jiu-jitsu battle was like that in a few of my matches where I'd get a good position and then it was just like defend, mm -hmm. you know? But, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy the IBJJF rules. It's all fun. It's all jiu-jitsu. Yeah. 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 But being a brown belt, and you won just a, all the major titles already, do you feel like it's like you can't get any more notoriety at this belt level? Uh, I mean, now I want to do everything I did at blue and purple at brown because I feel like every time you step up in a belt, you know, especially everyone online and, and everyone thinks, you know, okay, they did that at purple, but I don't think they're going to do that at brown. And then I don't think they're going to do that at black. So it's always cool to, you know, keep proving people wrong like that. You guys mentioned online comments. Do, do haters motivate you or bother you? Sometimes it's both. A lot of times, like, you have to, I always have to remind myself, like, 90% of the people online are, like, blue belts like giving their opinions you know and if you really look at it it's like they've been training two years what do they really yeah. know you know like what, what I mean, being online ha having that anonymity like of not having to t be accountable for what you say like it just it gives them a voice and it gives their opinion when normally you totally disregard it like if someone if a blue belt came and told me like was <laughs> instructing me on how to barambolo or like how to finish like one of my moves I'd be like like thank you man but like come on like, no, everyone knows that guy in the gym who's, like, trying to instruct the people who are obviously more skilled or more knowledgeable than him. And, like, you just can't take what anything people say on that, those things seriously. But it's so negative, too. There's just so much yeah. negativity on there, man. It's just the forums, especially. The forums can be brutal sometimes. But, yeah, it just gives people a voice. But I get motivated a lot when people say, like, you're, you're saying how they say you're not going to do better at the next bell. Mm -hmm. but they got to remember, it's like you keep getting better, you know? People sometimes think that it's like, oh, that's how good he is, you know? Like, Mike Liera is like twice as good as he was as a purple belt, you know? I feel like I'm constantly getting better. So, I hate the comments. I try not to read them. Sometimes it's hard. They don't bother me too much. I think they're pretty funny. Uh, Man, they can, they can piss me off sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I get mad. So both of you guys started at different academies than you are now. And, you know, you hear words like Creonch and, and Trader and things like that. Do you think there's any truth to that, or do you think this is America? You're paying. You can choose where you want to train. I want me to take this one. For Go me. ahead. Okay, so jiu-jitsu is a sport, right? It's a sport just like any other sport, football, baseball. Like, you do develop, like, serious relationships with the people in your team, and you feel like they're, they do become your family. And if you left the team, it's not like they stop being your friends, you know? They're your friends in life. But ultimately, it's a game. We're all putting on big, like, thick geese and going and trying to choke each other it's like it's just a big horse play like we're just going and having fun it's not that shouldn't be that serious you know that people are freaking out over that i can understand there can be some uh like some sore feelings over like if a guy really helped you out and like really like helped you get to where you are and then you just leave i mean but ultimately you've got to do what's right for you you know i mean if if i had stayed at bj penn's gym I would never be where I am today. Like the, the, le the level over there just wasn't the same as the other places I went to to try and train, you know? And uh, I mean, ultimately, if you're really trying to be the best, you have to go train to be the best. And same thing with, if you go to college and you're trying to be like a really, uh, I don't know, a no, like a good lawyer, you're not just gonna stay at the col like a college you start at, you're gonna transfer to a better college or like do go on to graduate school and you gotta pursue that, you know? I've ended up now, I'm in a place where I'm with the best jiu-jitsu fighters in the world. World like Hoffa Mendez is probably the best pound for pound jiu-jitsu fighter in the world right now. The entire ADCC camp, he has not been tapped. No one, he, no one has tapped him. The whole ADCC camp, it's ridiculous. And we have six guys going to ADCC on the mat. We have Dean Lister, who's won his division, the absolute, and a super fight already at ADCC. We've got Professor Andre, who's already double golded at the ADCC. It's insane. And then we've got a couple of invitees who are still going. JT and me are there. We're all going. It's like a crazy training camp. It's like super high level and you have to go and search out the, that knowledge you know if you're going to go there and try and get the knowledge might as well just put yourself there and just be completely bathed in it you know rather than hold yourself back by just like staying at a you know a gym that's not really going to help you reach your potential at least for the serious serious competitors you know if you're really trying to make it a career it's just not realistic but for people who are maybe in more like just do jiu-jitsu for fun and as a hobby. Even still, it shouldn't even be that serious. You know, you should be able to go where you want to go. And people shouldn't be able to get crap for that. Like I know a few people right now who are like, they're not really happy with their gym and like they're not being treated well, but they feel like they'll, there'll be a lot of drama if they leave and they don't want their disdain because they don't 
want to deal with that. They don't want to deal with what people say when really it's their choice, you know? Do you think it's a gang mentality? I, I don't know what, I don't know where it comes from. I think it's like people become very possessive over people. Like you almost get objectified as like you belong to them. It's like, no, I'm my own person. You're your own person. We can all go and do whatever we want, you know? And it's almost like, especially, I don't know, certain people who stand out in the gym or like they're more liked to the gym. They're like the popular kids at the gym. Like if they go and leave, it's like, wait, whoa, what's the deal? You don't like us anymore? You don't want to hang out with us? <laughs> you know, it's silly. The whole thing is silly. The whole crayonish thing is silly, especially the, like the forums go crazy with the crayons thing. Crayons, this, it's so, it's ridiculous. That's how I feel about that. Anything to add to that, Michael? I think the coolest thing is uh, I was listening to a professor tell his story and, you know, the instructor that he started with, uh, Kareka, or I think that's his name, right? I don't know. Uh, when, you know, professor started, when Andre started doing really well, and I think he was a purple belt or a brown belt, uh, his instructor, you know, knew he was outgrowing his academy and brought him to Terere pretty much, you know? And now, like, forever they have that bond and, you know, that respect because he really cared for Andre. Yeah. That's an know? instructor who really so had his students' best interests. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's so that's, that's a, like the coolest thing ever, you know, forever uh, he'll respect Kareka for that. Yeah. A lot of times I think it's the only reason people say that is because it's kind of like for selfish reasons because they feel like they're not getting, like, the, um, what's the word, like the... Um, hmm. Like they're not getting their due recognition. Yeah, the recognition for what for their the other person's accomplishments. You know, really. But truly, if you really want to help someone, you would want to put them help them get to the best place possible. Yeah, for sure. So you had a pretty tumultuous year. Yeah. Looking back at your training with your previous camp, uh, Team Lloyd Irvin, how do you look back on it now? Um, as far as the training went, it was awesome. I really learned a, a lot about myself out there. A lot of like, it was just my first introduction into what hard training was and like what to, to follow something, follow your passion with like a hundred percent effort, you know? And that was the first, like I moved there from Hawaii and Hawaii, I was still going to school. I, I was training, I was still trying to train twice a day, but it wasn't really intense training. And so when I went out there, it was like a totally new experience. And I, the biggest thing I learned out there was knowing what hard training is. It gave me like a baseline for like what I need to be doing to be successful at, I mean, at least at the lower belts. I mean, but I think now at Autos, like the training is totally different because you have so many high level guys and like we may train the same amount of hours, but when you have Andre Galvao and Hoffa Mendez choking you all the time, it's like, it's harder training. Like you're fighting harder. You're literally fighting harder during each match. Whereas if you have guys, it's like, it was just me and DJ and JT. Like after a while we start learning each other's games and it's just us. We have to rotate in on uh, lower belts and stuff. It can become like almost, you can just kind of cruise control through it. And, uh, but I definitely look back on it. Like the training was great. And Lloyd Irvin is an excellent coach. Like when he was a, like he's, he's very, he was very busy when he's out there. He had a lot of businesses he was managing, but he, when he would, could coach us and like really, like teach us not not so much the techniques itself but the mindset of it all it really was very valuable to me especially the mindset because I, I, I attribute most of my like being able to win in competition to your mindset I feel like that's the most important thing do you have any ill feelings towards the team or to Lloyd himself oh no I was never wronged in any way obviously I don't agree with what was going on over there but I, from I was never wronged he really helped me a lot he sent me all over the world to compete and I would never have the opportunity to compete like that um, in any other place like he was in a very it was a very unique situation to be in and it really helped it was just like a great opportunity to be able to fly and go all over the place and compete so much competition is like you learn so much from competition I think me and you were talking about that at uh, nationals like how competing was it's like you can almost learn more from that just from training, you know? Isn't so. it funny how when you talk to guys in the gym, because there'll be guys, I'll say, hey, are you competing this weekend? No, no. Yeah. They, people come up with so many reasons yeah. why not yeah. to compete. Yeah. I mean, it's probably better that they don't compete. It's just like crowds the brackets. <laughs> <laughs> stay home. It's all right. Less matches. Speaking of competitions, you had a competition in the finals against um, Paulo Miao, which happens a lot. Yes. And um, it was in Abu Dhabi. And... You and, and Paulo were both DQ'd, and the crowd erupted in cheers. How did you react to the crowd, and what do you think about the fact that you were DQ'd? Um, at the time, I was really upset. I even like did a very like not thought out interview after the process of being DQ'd. But uh, I mean, I can I can see why people don't like that. But really, I at the time I felt like I didn't have any other option. Like that was my mm -hmm. strategy against him. It had worked before. I was gonna keep trying to do it. 
there's six thousand dollars on the line like i'm gonna try and win you know the double dq that was weird because i'd never seen that happen before so i wasn't really sure like the legality of it and ibjjf rules but really when it comes down to it they're not ibjjf they make their own rules like it's up to them whatever they do like you can't say anything because right. um, you are competing in their tournament and it's on their dime like they send you out there like really what they say goes so you can't really be upset about it win or lose wh- however if there's any like stuff going on behind the scenes like trying to get like have certain people win it really doesn't matter you know you got to understand in every competition that you're not out there just trying to compete uh, defeat your opponents you also have to defeat the refs too in anything any IBJF tournament like the refs will make mistakes they may pr- purposely do it you never know like but you have to be able to constantly be aware like where you're at with the ref like what if he's giving advantages for things if he's not giving advantages for the smaller things like and you have to constantly combat that as well as beating your opponent it seemed like that match prompted you in your next match with paulo to be a little more focused on passing the guard actually no i was going to do the same thing (laughs) (laughs) i wasn't going to change for anyone uh what happened that match is because of the dq the ref like the the rules kind of changed on me. They did something I've never seen before, and it's not it's not in the rules per se. But st- the stalling rules in IBJJF, or if people are stalling, you give the stalling call to the person stalling, right? Depending on the situation. Like if you're on bottom side control, it's not your fault if you're stalling. Usually, it's like the guy's supposed to be moving on and doing something. So like standing, standing, people are just standing there holding each other's lapels. Both people get stalling calls, right? So double guard pull in the past. It's like equivalent of standing, but like on the ground, right? And so both people get DQs. But at that in that match, Paula was more active than me from the double guard pull because I'm not, re- I'm really not that good at double guard pull. Like I don't have that many attacks from there. I just like I can, I know that at the end of the match I'm going to be on top. Like I'm going to get up. I'm going to be on top. I'm bigger than Paula. Like at the end of the match, that's just what's going to happen. And so I got the stalling call, the first one, and he didn't, and that totally threw me off. I was like, whoa. So I'm the one stalling now, and it changed the whole dynamic, and that's when I was like, okay, I guess I have to get up. And so I don't know if the ref planned that, like that, but it's not against the rules. It's like, it is stalling. If I was stalling, I was stalling. But it did throw me off a lot, and uh, so now I have to like kind of rethink my whole strategy because if that's what's going to happen, I would, I would either have to be more hype, hyperactive in the double guard pull, but, I mean, there's really nothing to do from there anyways. So might as well just try and pass. So we've seen a lot of guys, a lot of super talented guys, much like yourselves, leave the sport of jiu-jitsu and go to MMA just because they want to make a living. Nowadays, there's more and more opportunities to make money in jiu-jitsu. There's a lot of super fights, a lot of paid tournaments. Does, what are your guys' thoughts on the future? Do you think you're going to have to go to MMA or do you, are you going to make a career out of jiu-jitsu? Michael, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm not going to MMA. I'll, I'll, set, I'll make that official right now. That's not you know on my to-do either. list not going there ever we, we always talk about this yeah. too i was listening man just for the brain damage reasons <laughs> i was listening to joe rogan podcast and he did, said something really opened my eyes and he was like if you do if you're trying to get the feeling of competition out of like the martial arts don't do mma he said he's he's seen so many guys who in the ufc who's he's watched their brain function degrade over time wow. that he says absolutely not worth it and that you don't want to do that and I mean, like there's guys that are just tough and you know and they just want to fight and they just go in there but like i feel like my brain is the most valuable part of my jiu-jitsu like mm-hmm. that's the like that's what helps me i don't want to damage that in any way at all and i've actually had a few concussions because i was really into mma for a while and then i finally stopped training it while i was in maryland because i was going to do a, a amateur fight and i got two concussions over the course of two weeks and i was like had bad vertigo and like the room was spinning and i couldn't do jujitsu really and i was like man i'm not going to do this anymore and so yeah my dad uh he's a jujitsu guy he's a brown belt as well and he started managing the arena which is an mma gym down in san diego and you know he wasn't really too into MMA at the time like we watched it but he didn't know about the training and everything and once he started you know to be around that environment we both kind of saw like wow this is tough you know like the guys aren't getting paid as much as you think they are and they're working you know really really hard and it's you know it's really political the whole MMA game so uh, we pretty much came to the conclusion if if you don't love to fight like if MMA isn't something that you love to do If you're doing it for the money or the fame or, you know, whatever, you know, anything else other than the fact that you love it, it's not it's not the right thing to do. Isn't the bait like the base pay for UFC is like three thousand to show or something or three thousand to win. The 
biggest like, yeah, organization. That's like the the you know? majority of the people in the UFC are getting that payment. And for what, three fights a year, four fights a year, you got to spend two to three years to really work your name up to the point where you can even get paid more. And then mm-hmm. even at that point, you have to be su- such high caliber that you have to stand out and almost be like champion level to make more money than that. Yeah. It's like there's like five guys in the UFC that are actually making money. It's like the know? lottery. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And you're, you're sacrificing your brain function and your body and injuries and just like... The whole time you're paying medical you know, bills and different yeah. fees like that. For sure. And it, in jiu-jitsu, like, you can do seminars, you can do super fights, you can win tournaments, like, the pay good money, like, mm-hmm. private lessons. You can have you can a man- gym. You can have a gym. There's really so many opportunities to make money in jiu-jitsu. Um, Without you, getting concussions. On yeah, and, not, basis, and not, yeah. you don't even have to be professional level. At Purple Belt and Brown Belt, you can do this now. Yeah. Which is crazy. It just keeps growing. It didn't used to be like this, I don't think, but not in the really. last couple of years, like, there's jujitsu has been growing up, growing hugely. Like I've, I've seen people, I see people in airports. I see people on the street now that do jujitsu and they'll recognize me sometimes. Like just cause they do jujitsu, they go to like a local Gracie Baja gym. It's like everyone does jujitsu now. Yeah. If you say, if you tell someone you, you do jujitsu and they don't do jujitsu, chances are they know someone that does jujitsu, you know, and they'll tell you where they train. It's probably nearby. It's crazy. You know, there's really no point to go to MMA just for the money anymore. Unless you really think you can go be the next Anderson Silva. You know? Or if you just love you right. know, getting yeah. hit and, Hitting. Like Frank Camacho, he just loves getting hit. Mm. He used to tell me, he's like, man, Keenan, I think, I think there's something wrong with me, man. I just <laughs> like getting punched in the face. It's like, yeah, there's been a few is. times, though, where Keenan's pushing up against the walls in yeah. training. That's yeah. like the closest thing we get to. Is we work our MMA cage defense against the walls <laughs> in the class. I'm always using the walls, using my cage defense. Walls. We have ropes at our gym. You can, like, hang from those. Swinging. Swinging. Swinging, swinging flying triangles. I tried to hit one on Mike Carpenter. Mike Carpenter. <laughs> So, Keenan, a lot of people think that you might be the third American world champion. Oops. We had uh, uh, BJ Penn and um, – and uh, I'm just blanking on his name right now. Lovato. 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 And uh, people think that you might be the next. Do, do you care about being the next American world champion? Um, I've never really looked at the idea of just being the next American one because I have goals much higher than that. Like, like I was talking about the mindset earlier, I really – think that you really have to believe it before you can achieve it and so people can take that as arrogance or cockiness sometimes but you actually to be successful in for me my personal formula for being successful is to believe it before I actually do it and you have to believe it even when there's no proof of it being possible yet you have to know that you're the best even when there's no proof even though you can't prove it to yourself that you're the best but having that confidence doesn't make you the best, but it allows you to perform at the highest level your body can. Like it, reaching your full potential in co- in a competitive setting, if you have that confidence and you feel like I'm the best, I'm the one who's going to win this, it stops you from having doubts. It stops you from hesitating. All those things can kill it for you. And so, I've always I've if I say if you're going to be the next world champion, the next American world champion, why not say you're going to be the next guy to win ten world championships? in a row, like Hodger style. Like, so that's what I want to do. I just want to win it over and over and over again, like set records, in it, you know? So I tell myself, like, that's what I'm going to do. Like, that's my game plan, ultimately, with jiu-jitsu, is just to keep winning it over and over and over again. So I don't just see myself winning, being the next American black belt world champion, but I see myself being the first American double gold black belt world champion, and then the first four-time black belt world champion, and so on and so forth, until I don't want to compete anymore. Nice. Yeah. So your next two uh, events coming up are Nogi events, ADCC, and then you got Nogi Worlds. What, are you doing Nogi Worlds? Yes, I'm going to try to. It depends on if I have any injuries from ADCC or anything, but I'm, right. I'm planning on it now. I'll register. And you also have the BJJ Expo super fight against Lucas Leitch. But you had a, an interesting comment on Nogi from, that you posted on your Instagram, and I want to read it right now. Keenan said, Nogi is jiu-jitsu's lame, less technical brother who you don't really want to hang out with because he's really sweaty all the time, but he's still your brother, and once a year, you have to give him attention and love to show him he's still in the family. But do you really feel that way? <laughs> there are days that I feel that way. Sometimes I hate Nogi, man. But I, that was like when I uh, first started getting back into it after the gi season, and you're just like, man, I want my grips back. I want, my yeah. more, I want to be able to grab the gi. I want all the more options that the gi has. And... Uh, but I definitely like the gi way more than no gi. No gi, like, you have to work so much harder physically. It's like, it feels like it takes a little more athleticism. Like, you gotta move faster. You have to, you can't hang on to people as easily. So it's like, there's definitely gonna be more movement always just because you can't hold a person. And there is less technique to it. Like, you can't deny it, there being less technique to it because there's so, 
when you eliminate the gi, like you eliminate all the grips, all the um, control, all the different guards you can play, like all the chokes, all just all the submission opportunities in itself. Like, and no gi can come down to just like it, you're either a reverse de la Hiva spinning to the back kind of guy, or you're a half guard guy from bottom, and then it's like. On top, you're either an over-under passer or you're like open, like Toriano style passing. That's pretty much all you're, or double under, you know? And it really comes down to that. Like who's got the double under pass? Are, is your wrestling good? And so I just like the very the, the variety of the gi more. But I like no gi too, but just not as much. So of course, there's a lot of things you can do in the gi that you don't do in no gi, but are there some things that you do in no gi training that you don't do in the gi? I mean like heel hooks and stuff. And that's always fun to play around with, but ultimately I like, I like judo more than wrestling. Mm -hmm. I like. Um, I'd ra I don't mind not reaping the knee. Like I don't. It's not a huge part of my game that I want to reap the knee and go for heel hooks. And it's just so slippery. It can just be frustrating sometimes. It's you have to be like you have to g take a different mindset and be like, okay, I'm going to train no gi. I have to be aware that if I get a position, there's a good chance the guy's just going to slip out and just like, he's just going to be gone. And I, all that work I just put in to get yeah. that position just could be gone. <laughs> and I'm gassed and tired now, and I have nothing. That's how I feel about the tournaments. Like. In the gym, no gi's fine. I always like gi better because uh, I like gi more just because of the grips. And, you know, I, we train gi primarily. But in no gi, I, I enjoy training no gi. But then once you get to the tournament, like, as soon as you start to work something, the guy on top or even the guy on bottom just runs away, you know. And it's so easy to do that, yeah. that most tournaments, uh, no gi, they end up, like, 2-0 or advantages, or one guy's just pressing and the other guy's running away more. So it's a lot harder to compete in nogi. Especially, like, a thing I do a lot is, like, I feel it's so much easier to not get your guard past nogi yeah. if you just go into stall mode. Like, I, I can just stall and just, like, kick away, push, like, just make them slide. Like, if the mats get real slippery, I push them a little bit, their whole feet will slip out, their knees will slip out. Like, it's so easy to just stall from there. And I use it all the time like against oh, Professor mm -hmm. Andre. Like, I'll just go yeah. into stall mode. Just like, <laughs> push, 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 push. And it's frustrating for him. He talks about me and Hoffa having boring guards because it's true. We just won't We just won't do anything. We'll just not get past, you know? He See? still passes my stall mode, though. <laughs> <laughs> he, he pushes through the stall mode on me. Yeah, me too. You guys have the unique uh, ability to train at both the Mendes Brothers Academy and Galvao's Academy. How would you contrast the two? It's pretty similar training because we're really we're training with the same people yeah. like when we go up there it's you know it's me the professor andre liera you know the competition team goes up there and then on in the morning times hoffa comes down to us and so it's kind of the same training each both place like uh, the one difference is obviously Guy Mendez is there. He's not doing the ADCC camp with us, but when I go up there, it's nice to, it's cool to hear his thoughts on Jiu Jitsu. And he, he was talking about no Gi and stuff and how you can't really play the same Gi guards. And you have to be more about leg locks to sweep and cool, just cool different ideas mm -hmm. that you would never think about. So having like another black belt instructor who's really smart like Gi um, is a good benefit too. Yeah, pretty much the only difference is you're either going to train on white mats. At AOJ or black and really blue mats? Really slippery mats. The white, the mats at AOJ are slippery yeah. during no gi, man. Softer, though. The white ones are softer. Yeah, they have yeah. tires underneath, so it's real soft. Right. And a lot of people don't give uh, Guillermo Mendes enough credit because he's not competing as much as, as his brother, but uh, he has an incredible passing and uh, fighting a, guys a lot bigger in the uh, in the academy. You know, he never does the absolute division in the tournaments, but in the academy, you can see him fighting against some big guys and doing really well. Yeah, he's sick. Yeah, he's my favorite fighter for a long time. Still, uh, all of 2012 when I first came to Atos. Uh, and he was here training with us in San Diego before he had AOJ. He drilled with me every day, and he improved my game so much in cool. those few months. Well, we're going to go to the mats in just a moment, and uh, Keenan's going to show something cool. I don't know what yet. But before we do, let's take one last look at a viewer email. A viewer named PJ writes in saying, I keep hearing rumors of Eddie Bravo versus Hoyler Gracie 2. Do you think this match will ever happen? And PJ, thanks for the, the email, and I can tell you, yes, they are working on it. Uh, this is a match that will be a rematch of the 2003 uh, ADCC match, in which case uh, Brown Belt, Eddie Bravo, triangled Hoyler Gracie. You know, this has been 10 years ago. Uh, you guys probably weren't even in, in jiu-jitsu at that time. Do you, do you guys care about this match? Have you seen the video, the Joe Rogan video, behind the scenes of after Eddie Bravo beat them? That's a yeah. cool video. Yeah. That's like 
That's intense. I haven't seen it. It's really cool. It's like Eddie Bravo, like tripping out or just tapping Hoyler, and Joe Rogan's there, like, "Yeah, man, you did it." He's just super hyped. It's just really cool behind the scenes. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I would like to see that match. I think, I mean, it's gonna obviously gonna be much different. I mean, I don't think either of them are really actively competing anymore, right? Right. So, it probably it's not gonna decide who's better or anything, but it'll still just be a fun thing to see. Uh, where my dad works, the strength and conditioning gym back there is where uh, Hoyler's been working out, and it looks like he's working really hard, so uh, I'd really like to see that match. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited about it, too. Uh, where is he at? Like, there's a strength and conditioning gym behind the oh, arena. okay. Yeah. Cool. So a date has not been set. Uh, any more information we get, we'll definitely let you guys know. But uh, so much cool jiu-jitsu events to look forward to. The ADCC yeah. coming up pretty soon. Unfortunately, no live broadcast. But the BGJ Expo coming up uh, not too far behind that. Tons of great action taking place there. Uh, IBJJF, Nogi Worlds, Masters and Seniors Worlds. Just a lot of things for the jiu-jitsu fan. And five watch. grapplings trying to come up with something in L.A. soon, too. Yep. And then another jiu-jitsu battle in the works, too. Yeah. So, yep. It's just always. Like... I don't even have time to go do seminars anymore because it's just there's a competition every yeah. weekend. It's like you got to, and then the weekends that are free, it's like you just want to kind of want to chill. Right. There's no time for anything. It's just it's everywhere now. That's great though. Like like I mentioned earlier, that all those opportunities keep you guys in mm -hmm. the sport because you know you, you guys both said that you don't want to go to MMA, but guys in the past had no choice yeah. but to go. You know they really didn't fortunate. really have any work skills, so they knew how to do jujitsu. So We're really in like the renaissance of jujitsu right now. <laughs> yeah. For real, like stuff like just everything's just going up right now. That's right. All right, guys, we're going to be right back on the mats with Keenan Cornelius and Michael Liera, Jr. <laughs> 